Hey guys, um, I'm back with you guys with another look at reform movements during, well, antebellum reform. So last time we had talked about some of the reform movements that we see on the screen here. We had talked about religious reform groups and the Second Great Awakening. We had also talked about utopian communities like the Shakers, Oneida, Brook Farm. We had also talked about um, transcendentalism, which falls under that too. So we talked about Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and we had also talked about prison and asylum reform with Dorothea Dix, educational reform with Horace Mann, and um, we had left off with one of the biggest movements, uh, which was temperance. So. Um, we're going to talk about two major movements now. We're going to talk about women's rights, in particular the fight for women's suffrage. And we are also going to talk about the anti-slavery abolitionist movement today. So that will round out our antebellum reform. Now, Apish likes to do like compare and contrast, change over time, over antebellum reform. So. Uh, topics like temperance will be one of those that Apush will probably have you do like a change over time with when we talk about our next reform movement, which will be progressive era reforms. And that happens around the turn of the century, like in the early 1900s, but we could see traces of it happening during the Gilded Age, um, but again, full force during the progressive era. So, the other movement that transcends time will be that of women's rights and in particular the fight for suffrage so that is another one and you know when we cover that today i want you guys to pay particular attention to that one as well because that is one that transcends over time like temperance the fight does not end here with antebellum reform however with is it probably arguably the biggest movement that comes out of antebellum reform with the anti-slavery abolitionist movement, that one does not transcend over time. We know the outcome of that. The Civil War happened, and with the 13th Amendment, slavery was abolished. So out of the big three, temperance, women's rights, and women's suffrage, and then anti-slavery, the abolitionist movement, the one that actually accomplishes its goals completely during this time period is going to be that movement right there, the anti-slavery abolitionist movement. So um, let's go ahead and break into women's rights and um, women's suffrage. So a little bit of background for you guys. You know, the role of women had been changing. Back when we still had cottage industries and man and a woman worked side by side in the household, there was arguably more equality because you could truly see how women contributed to society. But with the growing market revolution and industrialization and such, work was now being transported outside of the home. And thus, you know, what ended up happening was Women are relegated to more of a, what we consider now, a more traditional gender role. And men would increasingly, you know, take on that more public appearance, public sphere role. And um, we will see growing inequalities amongst men and women during this time, driven by, you know, industrialization. Um, for, you know, for part of it. So women are going to be inspired by the Second Great Awakening to do things that they hadn't done prior. The Second Great Awakening is as much of a political new start for them as it is, you know, one that fits into their traditional gender role because women, of course, are going to become the more moral of, you know, the two between men and women. Women are going to take on that moral compass. So, um, like we were talking about last time, antebellum reform 
is carried out by middle class and upper class individuals. Just like what we're going to see later on with the progressive era, middle class and upper class individuals will take on those reforms as well. So women are going to become very active outside the home, which at that time was kind of taboo because, again, traditional gender rules. So the way that women become politically active is through religion, honestly. And since the Second Great Awakening was really pushing topics like temperance and the abolition movement and, you know, other reform movements that we had spoken about, women are going to take up those causes and devote, you know, their leisure time towards this religious mission of, you know, trying to change the world for the better by getting rid of some of those vices like alcohol, you know, getting rid of our societal evil of slavery. So women, again, are going to become very active in those two causes, temperance and abolition. And, you know, this is all kind of like a perfect storm for them because it fits right into this whole notion of the cult of domesticity. Women are going to, like we said, they're going to like mold and be shaped into these traditional gender roles where you see like the doting wife and mother, you know, looking so contently into her husband's eyes and yet, you know, still being that nurturing force for her children. Now, this cult of domesticity is kind of like an offshoot of like the Republican motherhood. Women are going to, yeah, be constricted by it, but they're going to still be really sneaky and operative and resourceful. And they're going to really take charge with this in a way when it comes to navigating the waters of activism. Because again, the Second Great Awakening really helped with that. Now that women are seen as being the moral compass of the household, the one that is good natured, you know, not getting involved in nasty affairs like politics in public. Behind the scenes, women are becoming politically active by joining those same movements that the Second Great Awakening preachers had been preaching about to them. So, this was society's role for women to be the housewife and mom and be a good one at that. But, of course, underneath the surface, women are mobilizing for their rights. Women reformers are going to get involved, especially in abolitionism. And, you know, with their involvement in abolitionism, they see how this movement that was essentially designed to help out their fellow man and to gain more rights and more freedom for those who are enslaved. Women start to look inward as well as far as like how they're treated within the abolitionist organizations and they see that they too themselves are taking on secondary roles, that they're cast aside for leadership roles and they're voices aren't necessarily heard as much. They're, see their, how society considers them as inferior to men. And they also look inward into how society views them as far as like um, education. Women were still not allowed to attend college. They weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to control their own property. Because in a legal sense, women were their husband's property. Women did not get the children from a divorce. Women, if their family was rich, that wealth didn't stay with him. It went to their husbands. So this is all helping women to see their role in society and how they're just cast aside. So they're going to start organizing. And um, they take the lessons that they've learned with the abolitionist movement as far as like organizing and trying to push their agenda politically. 
and um, they fight for their own rights as well. So the rights that we're talking about early on, women want to have the right to own property. They want divorce reform to where women are taking more into consideration. Because seriously, I know nowadays we think of divorce like, oh yeah, the mom gets the kids. Not necessarily. Back then, the husband got the kids. So this is part of the reform that they want to do. And they also want that right to vote because that will in turn lead to more rights in the future if they have a political voice, especially in elections. So how women start to like rebel and um, show this push for like more freedom and more rights is honestly <laughs> through fashion. So we're going to see bloomerism occur. And bloomerism is, I know, I know guys, this looks kind of ridiculous now, but trust me, this was like a fashion forward statement because women, you see how like in the image in the left, how these women are kind of like side eyeing <laughs> the women wearing the bloomers, how they're like, oh my God, what's that girl wearing <laughs> kind of thing. Um, what the hell is she doing? She's smoking in public. She's wearing these bloomers that are showing her ankles for God's sakes. And they, you see how they're, they're more dressed in your traditional, like, oh, let's cover up everything kind of way. But these ladies with bloomers are confident. They just don't give a crap <laughs> about what people think about them. Look at how confident they appear. And really, they are challenging not only societal norms for our manners of dress, but also societal norms for our manners of, or for our behaviors. <laughs> so, speaking of fashion back then, I mean, fashion was very constrictive back then. Dresses from the 1840s and 1850s, I mean, 1840s we got the big poofy, like, you know, sleeves and stuff, which, yeah. Not necessarily the easiest thing to move around in. <laughs> um, and the 1850s, we start to see like a more slender silhouette, but you know, look at that restrictive corset that uh, that woman has on. And even the kid, even the little girl has on a corset. So we're seeing very constrictive fashion for women. And that's why like bloomerism and these bloomers are going to help like push that fashion envelope and in turn, you know, mirror what women are doing in society, pushing that, those traditional gender roles by organizing and pushing for their rights. So where this all comes to a head is actually at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in 1840. This was held in London. And a lot of prominent abolitionists traveled to this convention, including the likes of Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So these women um, who attended this meeting thought that, hey, we're finally going to be able to address, you know, these evils of slavery. We're going to have our voice heard, our ideas heard during this meeting. But what ends up happening is that these women are placed in the balcony area. And you can see how crowded it is on the floor right there. You know, can you necessarily hear somebody speaking from the balcony with a big meeting like that? No. So this is gonna really anger Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. They're gonna be like, this is a bunch of crap. What the hell, we traveled all this way and like we're still treated like second class citizens in a movement which propel civil rights <laughs> and the rights of their fellow man. So they decide that, you know what, enough is enough. Women need to come together with our own convention and those who are sympathetic towards our cause. And they decide that in 1848, this convention will be held in New York. And where this convention is held is at Seneca Falls. So the Seneca Falls convention is crucial to the beginnings of the women's rights movement. 
In attendance, not only do we have Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton leading the show, but we also have other prominent abolitionists like Frederick Douglass, I believe, William Lloyd Garrison even attended. I mean, it's basically a who's who of reformers that attend this. And the purpose of this meeting, of course, was to discuss social, civil, and religious conditions and rights of women and um, bring about this awareness of this whole second class status that women were receiving at that time and come up with ways to like fight the system, make it better. There's about 300 people in attendance, maybe a little bit over 300 people. And what they end up drafting is a document, which is freaking brilliant. It mirrors the Declaration of Independence almost word for word. But instead of like saying king, it says man and men that women are trying to gain their independence from. So, um, Frederick Douglass actually speaks out in this meeting and, you know, he ends up advocating for women and the right to vote for women. This will be kind of an interesting tidbit for later when we talk about the 15th Amendment, um, because his stance will change at that point, but for now, he is advocating that women get the right to vote. Now, unfortunately, women do not get the right to vote right away. It's a very long process. And women will not get the right to vote until the 19th Amendment, which is finally made official in 1920. So a lot of these early leaders of the women's rights movement have passed on, but one did survive. <laughs> and rightfully so, one, you know, uh, this must have been such a happy occasion for Charlotte Woodward, because she was 19 years old when she attended Seneca Falls. And she lived long enough to see women get the right to vote. Although, unfortunately, she was too ill herself to go to the polls to cast her vote. But she was alive to see women carry out this dream that herself and these 300 other people had pushed for for so long. So there is some there is some vindication in that. That's that's such a nice a nice touch right there that at least one got to see it. So speaking of the declaration of sentiments that um, the women and men at this convention helped to draft, especially Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, she's the primary author of this. This is what we see in this document. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. We go on. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. And we continue. He has withheld from her rights which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners. Yeah, there is a little bit of nativism in there. Um, continuing. Resolved that it is the duty of men, is the duty of women, excuse me, of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elected franchise. So, I mean, this is incredibly, <laughs> you know, the Declaration of Independence, like straight up, like a lot of these lines are like direct, like rips from the Declaration of Independence. But, you know, you see how they inserted like men, you know, as the one that women are trying to gain, gain a bit of independence from. So later on, we're going to see probably the one of the most visible um, leaders of the women's rights movement join forces with Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It's going to be Susan B. Anthony in 1851. And of course, it's after Seneca Falls, right? A few years after Seneca Falls. But these two are going to become an unstoppable force. And they're going to push so hard for women to get suffrage, to get the right to vote. 
So it's through their efforts and the efforts of women who come after them that women are able to get the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment. And like we we're saying, these two don't live to see it because, I mean, it took so long, so long from Seneca Falls to the passage of the 19th Amendment. Now, we need to also put into question where women of color fit into this. And women of color, especially women like Sojourner Truth, are going to have like a dual struggle between, you know, their role as a woman and a struggle as their role as a minority in America. So at an anti-slavery convention um, in Akron, Ohio, this former slave, this abolitionist and women's rights advocate, Sojourner Truth, is going to do a very famous speech. And uh, the title of the speech is called Ain't I a Woman? So here's what it says. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think between the Negroes of the South and the women of the North, all talking about rights. The little, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. That little man in black, who was a minister, there. He says women can't have as much rights as men, because Christ wasn't a woman. Well, where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now that they are asking to do it, the men better let them. You can like see right there. I mean, definitely she is saying that, you know, women should be allowed to do these things. And she goes on to say in, in you know, the speech, like even further that, um, women are, you know, have been cast aside for too long. And she even like throws in the role of black women as well and how, you know, they do have that struggle because of their race. So yeah, this push for women's rights, I mean, is going to continue throughout the 1800s and um, we will see more and more activism with the women's rights movement in the coming decades. But um, I just wanted to introduce like women's suffrage and women's rights and the motivations behind it to you guys for now. We'll come back to it when we come back um, throughout, you know, with the passage of the 15th Amendment during Reconstruction and again throughout the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era later on. So, this fight is to be continued. So let's shift gears now and talk about the abolitionist movement. So, um, the abolitionist movement in the 18, early 1800s, like 1817, there's going to be the American Colonization Society that's founded at this time. And the goal of the ACS was to send free African Americans to Africa. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know guys, this idea in hindsight is ridiculous, but this is kind of what they came up with back then. So the goal is to have this colonizationist movement and to try to help these now freed African Americans um, who want to voluntarily leave America and go back to their ancestral home in Africa to help them start a colony. This area that we're talking about is going to be Liberia. That's, that's where we're talking about. So some abolitionists are going to criticize this and be like, oh, you're just kind of like skirting around the issue. Um, others are going to praise this and say, yeah, this is a good solution. So, um, 
slaveholders were kind of involved in this as well. Um, and that's kind of what pushes abolitionists to ultimately turn against this, you know, idea from the American Colonizationist Society. So, um, in the 1830s, abolitionists are going to basically wage war against this and try to discredit the colonization movement as a slaveholder scheme. But ultimately, um, there are about 13,000 people who, who do take up this offer and they do immigrate to Liberia. So yeah, that's the American Colonization Society. Though with the abolitionist movement, one of the very prominent voices that we will hear about is going to be the voice of William Lloyd Garrison. So the abolitionist movement is organized by him, as well as Arthur and Lewis Tapin and others. They're going to form the American Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia. And um, abolitionists, of course, are anti-slavery, right? They believe that slavery was a national sin and that it's the moral obligation for every American to help get rid of it. Again, going along the veins of like the Second Great Awakening and what was being preached at that time. So William Lloyd Garrison, um, he is super passionate about this movement. I mean, to him, it's like an all or nothing kind of thing. So, he is going to publish these ideas in his newspaper, The Liberator, and he speaks out against slavery in favor of the rights of Black Americans and against stuff like the, the colonization movement. So the very first issue comes out in 1831, and Garrison is going to make it totally clear for Americans where he stands on abolition and on full citizenship for African Americans, which again, a lot of abolitionists um, kind of didn't want to go that far with having full equality. But William Lloyd Garrison, of course, is going to push for like all or nothing, right? I mean, he, he feels it in his heart that that is the right thing to do. So here's a quote from William Lloyd Garrison. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hand of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. So you see there, do you see, like, you know, his stance? I mean, how passionate he is about it. He really, really wants to end slavery and give equality for African Americans. So the anti-slavery societies are going to spring up all throughout you know, the New England area, basically. And you see, like, posters like this spread around various cities like Salem, Boston. I mean, just pretty much all over the burned over district. I mean, yeah. So even in Salem, we've got the Massachusetts um, Female Anti-Slavery Society. And this was founded by a black woman. So you're going to see so much activism during this time. Though, a good chunk of the country was not abolitionists. Abolitionists are going to face a lot of violence and hostility in the early years of the movement. Just like these two instances here. One instance with Amos Dresser in the 1830s. He was a minister in Memphis, Tennessee, which, you know, they have slavery there. And he was arrested and publicly whipped by a committee of prominent citizens in Nashville, Tennessee, for being a member of an Ohio anti-slavery society and possessing and disseminating anti-slavery materials. So he's like 
you know, handing out like pamphlets and stuff about like the wrong, the evils of slavery. And he is being whipped in public because of that. And then we've got the case of William Lloyd Garrison himself. On October 21st, 1835, he's dragged through the streets of Boston with a rope around his neck. He was rescued and turned over to the mayor. The mayor puts him in jail in order to keep him safe. But the angry mob attacked the carriage that was transporting him to jail and they almost captured him again. I mean, the violence that abolitionists endure is great. Because when we get to the case of Elijah Lovejoy, I mean, this guy gives his life to the cause. He publishes an anti-slavery like newspaper and it's been attacked over and over and over again. You know, people destroying his printing press. So he was murdered by an anti-abolitionist crowd in 1837. He and a few others were defending the new printing press that they had received when the mob came into the office and uh, wanted to destroy it. So we now have martyrs for the movement, Elijah Lovejoy being one of the first. And again, we're going to see like so much violence towards the anti-slavery movement. I mean, you know, Philadelphia, <laughs> the city of brotherly love is going to go crazy over the thought of an abolitionist convention being held in the newly built Pennsylvania Hall in May of 1838. They set this place on fire. So the large mob is going to protest against the abolitionists by burning down the building. So it's kind of interesting in a weird way that major cities in the north are going to be extremely anti-abolitionist. They're anti-black as well. And this all stems from like immigration. Immigrants see African Americans as definitely a um, competition for jobs if they were to be, you know, released from slavery and freed. So that's why Areas with high immigrant populations at this time are really going to be anti-abolitionist. So that's why, you know, Boston, Philadelphia, New York City, and others are going to not be very kind at all to abolitionists and very violent towards them. So, um, as we're moving on, there are some prominent abolitionists I wanted to bring up. I wanted to bring up uh, William Seward who um, is going to end up becoming... Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> I'm recording this on a Sunday afternoon, and apparently FedEx delivers on Sundays. So my dogs are going nuts. <laughs> um, but anyways, let's go ahead and talk about William Seward. So he's going to become uh, Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State later on, and um, he's definitely involved in this abolitionist movement. Um, he helps to write the Emancipation Proclamation later, and um, he's also going to aid in the Underground Railroad. So that's William Seward. Um, let's move on to Lucretia Mott. I mean, she helped to form the, uh, the women's rights movement with Elizabeth Cady Stanton in that convention at Seneca Falls, but she is also known for her role with the abolitionist movement as well as sojourner truth right i mean we talked about a speech from her anti-woman so she's going to be one of the most respected black women in the country and um because she gives these fiery speeches and she herself escaped the bonds of slavery so, sorry again guys now they're barking at my cat okay <laughs> Hopefully I won't be interrupted a third time during this. But anyways, um, let's go on and talk about the Grimke sisters. We've got Sarah and Angelina Grimke. So uh, the Grimke sisters add a new element to the abolitionist cause because at first it was so far just people from the North speaking about abolitionism and like the horrors of slavery with, a, you know, 
as we move on, we're going to have ex-slaves speak out in favor of abolitionism like Sojourner Truth. But the Grimke sisters add this element of Southerners speaking out in favor of abolitionism. Because the Grimke sisters themselves were from the South. They are from a prominent family in the South, which had a lot of slaves. So they move up north um, to join the abolitionist movement and, you know, they're denouncing slavery. People listen to them because, you know, they've seen firsthand the horrors of slavery and what would happen to slaves on the plantation that their father owned. So they're going to become heavily involved in the women's rights movement as well as the abolitionist movement. And um, their writings are going to be regarded as important pieces of literature for the abolitionist movement. So, you know, if they're ever to return to the South, they were threatened with imprisonment. Um, so, I mean, that's like how, how much damage they're causing towards like the slavery movement here. Now, um, if they're going to free their family's slaves when their father does pass away um, with the estate that he leaves them. So, I mean, they're going to follow through with that, but yeah, the Grimke sisters are going to add that new element to the cause here. Though the movement itself is going to go through a split, um, William Lloyd Garrison, of course, being more um, pushing more towards equality, and the other side of the movement is um, going to support this Liberty Party, which uh, has the presidential candidate James Bierney. So we're going to see a new a new society form that's going to split the anti-slavery society. So the American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society is now formed and William Lloyd Garrison is left, you know, with the American Anti-Slavery Society that has been weakened because of this split. So, um, we're going to see the Liberty Party formed in 1839 by abolitionists. It's the first anti-slavery party in the United States. Birney is their candidate in 1840 and 1844, and he then runs for governor in 1843 and 1845. This party is going to merge with the Free Soil Party in 1848, and it is through the Free Soil Party that later on we get them, along with anti-slavery like Whigs and Democrats, to form the Republican Party later. So, but anyways, William Lloyd Garrison doesn't believe that emancipating um, the slaves can be secured through a political process. He doesn't think that politicians would support this action. So he's going to um, form his own abolitionist organization. It's going to expand beyond the abolition of slavery into other areas as well. He's going to start using his newspaper to attack discrimination against women, smoking, drinking, the military, the clergy, the government, cruelty to animals. I mean, this guy is like super ahead of his time <laughs> as far as like, you know, wanting rights for like everything. So the anti-slavery movement turns towards politics at this time, again with that Liberty Party. Um, the government at this time was very non-receptive to like anything abolitionist because they feared political strife, sectional strife, and southern states like just walking out on them. I mean, this is around the time that John C. Calhoun's already like, you know, threatened secession. This is around that time, so yeah, they are definitely, you know, at odds at this time. So this Liberty Party that does form in 1840 wants to not only secure emancipation of, you know, slaves, but um, they want to do this politically, and they want to also repeal anti, um, you know, basically racial discriminatory legislation that's in the books. So, yeah, that's the split. Um, 
Frederick Douglass. You guys have probably heard about him. He is a very prominent abolitionist. And he himself is, you know, someone who escaped for his freedom. So he's going to be probably one of the most famous abolitionist speakers. His speeches are widely circulated and printed. I mean, he's going to go across the North giving lectures um, and using those fees to help fugitive slaves on their um, travel through the Underground Railroad. So Frederick Douglass is um, going to catch the eye of William Lloyd Garrison and William Lloyd Garrison is going to start hiring him as a lecturer for the American Anti-Slavery Society. So Frederick Douglass himself is also going to publish, you know, an, an autobiography, The Narrative of a Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. And he even starts up his own newspaper, The North Star. So he's going to become probably arguably the most famous like black man in the United States at that time. We will have others like him um, that will have also escaped slavery to their freedom and speak publicly for the abolitionist movement, um, but arguably he is the most famous. Another famous individual at this time is Harriet Tubman. She was more um, active in a sense where her actions like really like um, were more, yeah, she was more, <laughs> she was more active instead of like vocal, I guess you could say. That's what we remember her for. We remember her for her role with the Underground Railroad. So the Underground Railroad, just get rid of notions here, guys, um, was not underground, <laughs> okay? And it's not a physical railroad. Think of underground as far as like low key, like on the down low, and not necessarily like physically underground, okay? And the railroad, we're not talking about an actual railroad that will transport you places. We're, we're thinking more metaphorical in a sense that this railroad, we're following the tracks to freedom. And um, there are going to be various escape routes, depending on where you are in the South. Like, let's say you're a slave here in Texas. Your escape route would be to Mexico. Yeah, Mexico did not allow slavery at this time. So there's a good chance you could have been traveling on the Underground Railroad through the Rio Grande Valley and in other areas along the border. So, um, though what we really consider the Underground Railroad, at least like in layman's term, is going to be going up to Freedom up north. So, I mean, they're, they're your various routes to Freedom. Now, um, the Underground Railroad is going to be in operation from 1830 to 1865, and people are going to risk their lives trying to escape for freedom. Harriet Tubman herself is going to go several times through the Underground Railroad, assisting others to their freedom. And it's very dangerous. I mean, you had to find safe houses and whatnot, and essentially not get caught, right? Because if you get caught, that's death. So, there's no really formal organization towards it. Um, we're going to rely more on individuals to help uh, these enslaved people escape for their freedom. But the Underground Railroad is going to become massively successful. So, here's kind of a map of the Underground Railroad here. Another route would be to California. Yeah, because California in the 1850s is going to become a free state. So, um, there is a violent section to abolitionism, however. We don't necessarily talk about this too much, but there is. And uh, we're going to have people like David Walker and Henry Highland Garnett who are going to um, advocate for a radical solution. These are two Northern African Americans who believe that people should physically take action by rising up and revolting against their masters. We do see one such revolt with Nat Turner in 1831. He's going to lead a revolt in which 55 whites are going to be killed down south. 
And um, as a retaliation to this, whites are going to kill hundreds of African Americans in very brutal fashions to put down the revolt. Anti, um, well, not anti, okay. Slave laws are going to become a lot harsher and a lot stricter because of these things. Because they fear an uprising, for sure. Before Nat Turner, there had been some talks of getting rid of slavery down south, at least in some parts, but now that Nat Turner's revolt had occurred, the public fears these future uprisings. And um, this quickly puts an end to the anti-slavery talk down south. So more stuff that happens down south, we're going to have, um, you know, People attack the post office because they're distributing and delivering, uh, delivering anti-slavery literature and such. So I mean, there is going to be quite the resistance from the South against the abolitionist movement, and it all comes to come comes to head with how they view slavery, because how they view slavery is the reasoning behind it's going to like change a little. So before 1830. What the South is going to say to defend slavery is that it was a necessary evil. They feel that slaves were needed as, well, the labor source, right? To um, maintain the cotton fields and to help the Southern economy. And they argued that, you know what, Northern factories need this cotton, Southern Southerners need this cotton to, you know, gain money for their economy. Northerners needed it to um, help with the textile mills and them to gain money for the economy. But after 1830, um, people like John C. Calhoun are going to now present slavery as a positive good. A positive good, like what? Okay, slaves are portrayed as happy, content, well cared for within Southern society as sort of like a backlash to like abolitionism. Slaves, they argued, were better off than northern factory workers, who they considered to be wage slaves towards capitalism. Southern theologians are going to use the Bible to defend slavery. They're going to use scripture to say stuff like, well, you know, Abraham was a slaveholder. When Abraham came into covenant with God, he was commanded not to free slaves, but to circumcise them? Okay, that's weird. <laughs> um, the law of Moses did not abolish slavery, but rather regulated it. Christ condemned slaveholders and received them as believers. Paul in his letters admonished Christian slaves to obey their masters. And Paul exhorted Christian slaves to be content in their lots and not seek to change their situation. So that's kind of like the Southern angle that they're going for right now. Um, yeah. I don't even know where to go there with that, guys. I know, in hindsight, we're looking at this argument like, what the hell? Right? Back then, Southerners, this is truly what was being pushed. So, all right, let's round this up with Congress. Congress doesn't like discussing the slavery issue. And so in 1836, the House is going to push what's known as the gag rule to limit anti-slavery discussion, or rather just close it out completely. So they're going to automatically table, which means postpone, any action on anything relating to slavery. Any petitions, like anything. Uh, without hearing them. So it's basically like out of sight, out of mind for Congress. Um, stricter versions of this gag rule will be passed by subsequent Congresses throughout the years. And in 1844, the House is finally going to rescind the gag rule by, because John Quincy Adams, after he becomes president, he becomes a member of the House of Representatives and he himself is very strong with the abolitionist movement. So he's able 
<clears throat> he's able to get the House of Representatives to finally, you know, just get rid of the gag rule. So, yeah, that's why there's like such a lull between the Missouri Compromise and the Compromise of 1850. It's because that gag rule was in place. And yeah, this is the abolitionist movement, guys. I'm sorry for the interruptions. My dogs are crazy. And this is why I record late at night and not during the day. So, uh, yeah, lesson learned. Anyways, I hope you guys were able to pick up on a lot of stuff with women's rights and with abolitionism. So I'll come back at you guys next time when we start our road to the Civil War with Manifest Destiny. All right, talk to you later, guys. Bye.